to First Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. My name's Ashley, and I use she, her pronouns. And my name's Shay, and I use she, her pronouns. Please take a moment to sign in by using the QR code that you can find on the back of your bulletin or in the room. We've been attending First Church for a little over nine months. We found a community where we belong and where we can serve. We're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Welcome to First Church, an open open place place for all. Good morning. Welcome to First Church's virtual worship service. My name is Katherine Mullen and I use she, her pronouns and I serve as the Minister of Community Engagement here. And I would like to share some announcements with you this morning. Our first announcement is about next Sunday, July 3rd. On July 3rd, we'll be offering virtual worship only in recognition of the 4th of July holiday. So make sure you set a reminder in your phone so that you are not the only person showing up on campus for worship. Our next announcement is about our upcoming Enneagram conference in August. We are so excited to be hosting the Institute for Conscious Beings workshop, Return to Essence. Dive deeply into the spirituality of the Enneagram on August 12th through 13th. Over the course of Friday evening and Saturday, Dr. Joseph Howell and the faculty of ICB will help us understand how the Enneagram's wisdom can unlock your soul. The weekend will feature live music, teachings, theater, and small groups for explorations of your type, as well as interactive exercises that apply to daily life. The cost for the weekend is $97 and includes snacks and lunch on Saturday, and childcare will be provided with a reservation to children from six weeks to fifth grade. So make sure you are keeping an eye out for that registration link that will go live uh, and join us for that very wonderful, meaningful weekend about the Enneagram. Our next announcement is about our organ history and demonstration after worship today. Since its 1891 beginning, First Church has been on the cutting edge of pipe organs in the city of Birmingham. Our beautiful Cassavant pipe organ has a rich history of previous organs being reworked and rebuilt to create the instrument in use that's today. As part of the 150th celebration and immediately following 11 o'clock worship today, June 26th, Richard Bird will take us through a brief history of the First Church organ and demonstrate how the instrument works. We hope you will make plans to join us as we listen and learn from Richard together. Our last announcement is about the World Games. We are staying in touch with Birmingham City officials about plans for the World Games and how they may impact our location. We're currently planning to offer worship in person on Sunday, July 10th and July 17th, but we will continue to monitor the transportation plan for the city. We will make a call about possible changes to weekday office hours and worship as we get closer to the games. We appreciate your understanding as we work to help make Birmingham as hospitable and welcoming to the World Games as possible. Friends, with all of these announcements shared, join me as we call to worship. If you come into this place with the hope of growing deeper, with the hope of connecting, with the hope of glimpsing God. And if all of those things take place and your spirit is moved and you swear God is near and you feel more than lucky for the gift of faith and then the service comes to an end and it's time for you to leave and you ask yourself, where do we go from here? Then I would say to you, go out into the world to love and to share and to learn, but come back soon because this is the beginning. This is only the beginning. So come on in, fill your cup here, be present here. God is here. Let us worship, holy God.
Hear now this prayer of confession. Holy God, we are naturals when it comes to stalling out. We reach a certain point in the relationship, in the conversation, in our faith, and then we stall. We buy property on top of the plateau and build a house there, destined to never dig deeper or climb higher. Forgive us for giving up on the things that matter. Forgive us for confusing the plateau with the mountaintop. Forgive us for taking the easy way out. Instead of doing the hard work of curiosity, relationship building, vulnerability, and connection. Inspire us to see new paths for where we can go from here. With hope and honesty, we pray. Amen. Now hear these words of forgiveness. Family of faith, we are works in progress, but we are works in progress designed, created, and claimed by God. No matter what you have done or left undone this week, today is a fresh start. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God is with me on the mountaintop and God is with me on the plateau. I am loved, claimed, and forgiven. Thanks be to God. I invite you to hear the words from our first scripture reading this morning, which comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. Hear these words. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him and had left he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up into heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down and go to them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. I invite you now to join me in our prayer for this morning. God of conversation, we are here trying to be courageous. We are trying to be curious. We are here trying to build connections in this lonely and isolated world. We want to be somewhere other than here. We want to be standing in a place and time that is closer to your promised day, where all are fed, the prisoners are freed, guns do not rule the day, the homeless are housed, and every person knows their sacred worth. And we know we can't get there without honest and vulnerable conversation, but we don't always know what to ask. We fear saying the wrong thing. 
we fear offending. So we eat our words and stay quiet, hoping that answers will come, but they don't always come. Connection has never been quite so easy for us. So today we ask for your words. Plant questions in us that like seeds grow into a garden of connection. Plant affirmation in us that like laughter is contagious and mood changing. Plant curiosity in us that like rain washes away any judgment we carry, replacing it with a desire to understand. And when we have your words in our mouth and your mind in our hearts, then teach us how to listen. Teach us how to hear the message under the words, the grief, the hurt, the fear, the shame that hangs under sentences like bats under a bridge. Help us to hear and make space for those unspoken truths. Then teach us how to listen to voices that differ from us. Voices with different opinions, different histories, different perspectives. So that like Paul and Cornelius, we might move through disagreement and ultimately find you. God of conversation, we are here trying to be courageous. We are here trying to be curious. We are here trying to build connections. It's easier said than done. We need you like we need this community, like we need the sunrise every morning. So draw near to us. Teach us how to speak. Teach us how to listen. Teach us how to find you in the spaces between our words and our ears. God of conversation, we've been meaning to ask, where do we go from here? How do we speak truth? How do we listen for you? Guide us, be with us, hold us, unsettle us, catch us, feed us, fill us, meet us here. God, we are open, helping us to remember always to pray the words that Jesus taught us saying together, our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everything.
My name is Kristen Dedman. I'm your minister of children. I use she, her pronouns. This is Kate, and she and I are going to read our scripture today. It comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 23 through 48. Hear these words. So Peter. Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On, Peter. on Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshiped him, but Peter. made him get up saying, stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in, a, in and found that, he had, that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane and unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, Four days ago at this very hour, at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Therefore, I sent for you immediately and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of, of us are, in, are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded to say. Then... Peter. Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did in both Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Friends, as we move into a time of offering, I pray that we will all joyfully give. and welcome to First Church. My name is Erica Jobes and my pronouns are she and her. I am really honored to be here today to help wrap up the sermon series entitled I've Been Meaning to Ask. But before I get started, I'd like to quickly introduce myself. I'm a cardiology nurse practitioner, a wife to Jessica and a mother to three boys, John who is 15, Jack who is 13, and Charlie who just turned one. I have felt welcomed at First Church since 2019 and I just began serving on the executive committee this year. Well, we began the series, Jonathan kicked it off, I've been meaning to ask. And Jonathan reminded us that one of First Church's priorities is asking tough questions. And often tough questions don't have simple answers, but it doesn't mean that when we ask tough questions that it diminishes our faith. In fact, Asking tough questions can bring us together as the body of Christ if we're seeking to understand. Jesus asked tough questions. He was constantly asking questions and challenging the status quo. 
In fact, he loved questions so much, sometimes he would answer a question with a question. In medicine, it's said that proper diagnosis is half the cure. And it takes asking the right questions to get to the diagnosis, to get to a cure, or to find the common ground that helps us all move forward. You know, this sermon series comes at a critical time. We begin asking questions on our journey from division to wholeness and peace. So today we'll ask a tough question. Where do we go from here? Acts chapter 10 may actually give us some insight to help answer our question. In the scripture reading, we're introduced to Cornelius. He is a Roman centurion from the Italian regiment. We know that he's a Gentile. We understand from the scriptures that he is a devout, God-fearing man, that he's well spoken of by the entire Jewish nation, that he gives generously, and that he prays constantly. He was likely a non-commissioned officer, which meant that he had risen to his rank through his ability and through his loyalty. The term centurion means he was likely in charge of about 100 men, and a similar American military rank might be captain, which is a respectable rank and respectable pay. It's interesting though, in contrast to what we learn about Cornelius in the scriptures, we know that the Jews of the day believed that Gentiles were unclean and unworthy. And I think some of us can relate to being unfairly classified or judged. Well, the setting of the stories in Caesarea And biblical scholars and historians agree that uh, Acts chapter 10 took place sometime around 80 to 90 AD. During that time period, Caesarea was a very busy port city. And we know that it was primarily inhabited by Gentiles, although there was a large minority of Jews. And we know that there was great tension between the two groups. And living in Birmingham, I think we all can relate to living in a city where there's tension between groups. So we have this respectable guy, Cornelius, a Gentile living in a busy port city. And he's minding his own business, right? Despite uh, the tensions, often during this time period, fights would break out between the groups. Despite all that, he's minding his own business, doing his God-fearing things, and all of a sudden, an angel appears to him and tells him that he needs to go and summon Peter to come to his home. He immediately calls his servants and one of his loyal soldiers and he sends them to summon Peter. Now, remember, this is a pretty big deal because there is great tension between the two groups and he's a Gentile and he knows Peter is a Jew. So here's where the story gets into, gets interesting. Enter Peter, the Jew. Well, what do we know about Peter? By the account of three Gospels, he was the first disciple that Jesus called. We also know that he was a fisherman. And when we study what the fishermen were like during this day, we know that they were manly men, that they were hot-tempered, that they used vulgar language. I'm an Enneagram 8. I'm an 8 on the Enneagram, and... So I kind of think Peter might be my kind of guy. You know, he's quick to action, quick to speak, maybe a little impulsive, ready to fight or defend his cause. Remember, Peter is the guy that steps out of the boat onto the rough sea uh, and then begins to sink. He is also the guy who, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, drew his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant to defend Christ. And... So we know he was a little hot-tempered, maybe a little bit ready for a fight. So we have this guy, Peter, devout Jew fisherman, first disciple called to Christ. He falls into a trance and he has this vision and he hears a voice saying or telling him to eat four-footed creatures, reptiles, and birds. And he's like, "Uh uh-uh, no way. I have never put anything unclean in my mouth. And the voice comes back and says, what God has called clean, do not call profane. And this happens three times. 
It takes three times. It takes a divine vision to influence Peter's devout religious beliefs. I don't know about you, but I can think of times in my life where it took quite significant divine intervention for me to uh, reconsider my devout religious beliefs. So Peter's confused and he's sitting there thinking about this vision that he just had. And suddenly Cornelius's men appear and he's sitting there thinking about it. And then the spirit comes to him and wants to spell it out. And he says, get up and go with them without hesitation. So Peter does. And we really know what happens from here. <clears throat> Peter goes to Caesarea to Cornelius's home. Cornelius welcomes him in. He preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his friends and his family, all Gentiles. And while he's still speaking, the Holy Spirit falls down upon all of the people and they begin speaking in tongues and praising God. What an amazing scene that must have been. Just a little piece of heaven. And Peter then orders them all to be baptized and he stays with them for several days. So what just happened there? Well, it's said that Cornelius was the first Gentile convert. This is the biblical account of how God spread his love beyond the Jews to the Gentiles and even beyond the Gentiles to the entire world, to everyone. It's a story of radical inclusion. It's a story of a new consciousness, new beginnings for the church at that time. I'm sure many of us feel very comfortable with the idea of radical change, an open place for all. That's radical change. We cheer for Cornelius and his family and we say, let them in, include them. You know, and while you're at it, let us in, include us, equality. We read the story and we think, see, there it is, inclusion, God's love, God loves everyone, period, the end. Well. There's so much more to the story. Where did they go from there? Cornelius, he's a very respectable guy. We've talked about this. I mean, did he become angry at his previous treatment? You know, the, the Jews had excluded him. They had called him unclean. And the leaders of the church had tried to continue to exclude the Gentiles. I mean, he could have retaliated. He could have sought re revenge. You know, he was an authority in the region. He had charge of 100 men, but he didn't. Did he decide to break off of that early church and start his own church? I mean, he could have. He could have called it, you know, First Church of Caesarea or maybe the First United Cornelian Gentiles, but he didn't do that either. What he actually did was he invited Peter to stay with him and they ate meals together and they slept under the same roof and they prayed together and he listened to Peter. He spent time with Peter and probably more importantly, he let Peter spend time with him. What about Peter? What about the hot tempered fisherman, devout, law-abiding Jew, first disciple of Christ. What did he do? Well, my guess is that after Peter got to spend a few days with Cornelius, he began to see Cornelius's heart for God and not just the color of his skin or his demographics. You know, Peter went to Cornelius because he was given a divine instruction to do so, but he stayed, he stayed with Cornelius because he let love in because his definition of love expanded. He included and he transcended. Well, the story still isn't over. The scripture tells us that Peter was later criticized by the church in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. We know that there was a period of time of great resistance and, and, and great uh, controversy related to letting the Gentiles into the church. We also know that in the end, God's love won and that the gospel was preached to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. 
we know that the Jews had a new understanding of God's love. So, why was this story included in the scripture? Because God was giving us insight into a wisdom pattern. And this wisdom pattern has occurred over and over in history, and it occurs over and over in our lives. It's order, disorder, and reorder. I read an article in the fall of 2020. It was written by Richard Rohr for the Center of Action and Contemplation and one of their publications called Wanting. The article was called Include and Transcend and it was adapted from his book, The Wisdom Pattern. At the time, the article caught my eye because there was such great political division, racial tension, controversy about the pandemic. And I guess in some ways that hasn't changed. In his article, Richard Rohr offers us this wisdom pattern. He calls it order, disorder, and reorder. Mythology might call it um, the journey, the fall, and the return to a new home. And Gurdjieff, who many accredit with bringing the Enneagram to the West, calls it affirming, denying, and reconciling. At any rate, it is a wisdom pattern and it's a description of three forces in our lives and in our history. We see this wisdom pattern in Acts chapter 10. Rohr states that order by itself normally wants to eliminate any disorder, any diversity. It creates a, a very narrative, cognitive rigidity in both people and in systems. And we saw that in the early church uh, with their strict adherence to the law. We see it in our own lives though, when we are too rigid or too narrow-minded, when we don't ask the questions and then we certainly don't listen to the answers. And whether we know it or not, it's because we don't wanna disrupt that order. It's when our ego focuses uh, on separateness. Dualistic thinking thrives here. It's either my way or your way. And if I'm right, then you must be wrong. The second force in the wisdom pattern is disorder. Disorder occurs when we experience suffering or resistance because our previous order no longer works. In Acts chapter 10, this represents the criticism and the resistance that the early church at Jerusalem gave Peter for preaching to the Gentiles. In our own lives, it represents the suffering suffering that we've experienced when we feel alienated, when we feel isolated because of our own ego's focus on separateness. It's the suffering that we experience when we resist God's gentle tug on our spirit to learn how to love ourselves and to love others in deeper, broader ways. Disorder seems like a bad thing, but the wisdom here is that all three forces are needed for transformation, order, disorder, and reorder. We need all three for the unfolding of a new consciousness. And remember that the disorder or the suffering can be the crack that lets the light in. And then we have the third force, reorder. This is a transformation of people and systems. Reorder is when we find through disorder that we are deeply held and deeply loved by God. Reorder is a higher level of consciousness. It's an ever deepening understanding of the presence of God. For the early church in Acts, it was a realization that God's love was for everyone, not just the Jews. It was radical love. And for us, reorder is the same thing. It's, it's the understanding that God loves us at an ever deepening level than we understand and that God loves everyone. It's radical love. Looking back over my life, I can see this pattern. The order that I found in my early life from a very strict religion. And this strict religion had all the answers, but they were not asking any questions. And I remember the disorder I felt, the struggle I felt when I begin to question those small, oppressive religious beliefs. And I remember the struggle trying to reconcile 
how I felt about that with what the, the church was teaching at the time. And then in my early 30s, I remember the first break from that small, oppressive, religious dogma and the reorder that I felt as I began to feel more freedom in God's love. And I'll tell you that reorder at the time, it didn't feel, it didn't feel just perfectly wonderful. I definitely felt uneasy. You know, as we, we move into reorder, sometimes we are stepping slightly out of our comfort zone. And I know that was true for me. I had a, a deeper understanding of God and it was that deeper understanding that became the fertile soil for the entire process of order, disorder, and reorder to happen all over again. So where am I now? Well, if I was being honest, I would say that I'm someplace between disorder and reorder. How do I know? I think I know because I can feel a gentle pull inside a discontent and an understanding that there must be more. I feel uh, the unknowing, the luminal space. And I know that I'm uh, headed towards a new, a new part of the order. So we move from order, disorder to reorder. And reorder moves us forward in transformative ways. It sets the process for the entire, it sets the ground for the entire process to happen again. If we're lucky, this wisdom pattern can occur more than one time in our lifetime. When we understand the wisdom pattern in Acts chapter 10, we understand that we are called to include and transcend. Like Cornelius, we include and love those who have rejected us and called us unworthy and clean, unclean. And like Peter, we love and include those who have, that we originally thought weren't or were beneath us or who we didn't think of at all. We move through order, disorder, and reorder, knowing that each stage is there, is necessary for our growth and our spiritual transformation. Amen. Hear this affirmation of faith. We believe that God is a conversationalist, drawing close to us and asking, what do you need? Where does it hurt? Who do you long to be? We see this conversational God in Jesus Christ, God's own flesh who walk the earth speaking with the poor, the hungry, the lonely, and the outcast. Therefore, we believe that our call as people of faith is to continue this holy conversation with those who look and think like us, yes, as well as with those who share little in common with us. We believe that through these conversations, we are able to catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God. And so we continue the conversation in hope. Amen.
As we leave the sacred space together, I would like us all to remember that we're deeply loved and deeply held by God. And as we go out into our city, may we all include and transcend. Amen.